Four years ago, my family moved from the city. We couldn't take the fast-paced life, and we were a wealthy and well-educated family. So, we figured we would move somewhere remote and peaceful. Hyabee Forest, western part of Maine, is where we settled. Now, in our family, we had me, the oldest son, then you had my father, my mother, one brother, and one sister. Things were always fine around here. We lived off the land and life was great. But then, everything changed. And it wasn't for the better. Oh god, it was horrifying. I'm alone now. It got them. And I'm sure I'm next. So to whoever reads this story, I hope you never stay here. It'll get you too. These are my final thoughts and my horrific story. It all started when my sister went for water one day. She didn't return for almost an hour. But we lived alone out here. Or so we thought. I still hear her scream sometimes. That ear-splitting cry of terror and the scene of my father and brother flashing looks of extreme terror before breezing through the door. They came back, glistening blood on their pants and shoes, crying uncontrollably. They had found nothing left of her but a few bone splinters, her ripped clothes, and a puddle of blood. Things were never the same after that day. Mother never really spoke again after seeing her daughter's remains. The next person to go was my father. Our food was running low and we were snowed in, so we couldn't go to town. He grabbed his rifle and took to the wilderness around us. He didn't come back when we expected him to. My brother and I decided that we would go search for him in the morning. There was no need to go out then. Around 1am, I was dozing in a kitchen chair when there was a low guttural sound from outside the door. Then, a resounding bang, bang, bang on the door, and then a loud thump. A flash of a mottled black furred creature on two hind legs sprinted past my window. That set me off. I screamed at the top of my lungs until my brother ran to me and asked what was happening. I recounted the story to him, and he grabbed a rifle and handed me one, then motioned silently towards the door. He made to open it, and cracked it open very slowly, and gasped in fear. It was our father, or well, what was left. His corpse was mangled to extreme lengths, arms were gone, eyes were gouged out, and he was covered in claw marks that dripped crimson. My brother collapsed in horror and shut the door weakly. No one left the house anymore. My mother still never spoke. She just would weakly nod or shake her head to communicate if even that. My brother would break down at anything that reminded him of our lost family. But what I realized is that whatever that thing is, it's not stopping until it has killed all of us. I feel it. A few weeks had passed. We lived in fear. Some nights we would hear those horrid growls and we would make sure no one fell asleep that night. Instead, we would stay up with guns in hand until daybreak. One morning, after a long night of paranoia, my brother proclaimed that he was taking supplies and heading away to town. Freedom or death, he said. One of them happens today. He offered to take us with him. I pleaded with him not to go, but he insisted. I told him I would not go. My mother just shook her head mutely. He said he would send for help when he got to town and to keep everything locked. Don't you dare leave. Don't you even stick your nose out of that damn door, he said. 
I know I was only 10 months older than him, but I felt awful about him being the one who was going out. I knew it was going to get him. I knew. That night, he walked out just before dark fully struck, having made sure we were okay and had supplies, and began the nightmarish walk to the car. He got to the car and opened the half-frozen door after a few violent tugs on the handle. It was then that I heard the sound that unnerved me on the spot. He turned the key, and as the car started, a blood-curdling scream lit the night air. The beast left the trees from the side opposite my brother. The creature must have been almost eight feet tall, with a mangled black wolf's face and body but walked on its own two legs, or rather, sprinted. My brother opened his eyes in fear and smashed his foot into the gas pedal. The thing pounced onto the car and violently smashed his window. My brother steered wildly, trying to get away from the creature, but he crashed his car, smashed it into a tree. And if that didn't kill him, the beast reached into the car and pulled the still, squirming body out of the car. The creature looked right at me through the window from a distance, before slicing open my brother's stomach with razor-sharp claws. Blood dripped from his body and he went limp. The creature walked slowly towards the door, knowing he wanted me to fear him. He knew I was frozen. It reached the door, and I hugged my rifle tight. There was a thud, and another three bangs, although they went slowly this time. Bang. 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 Then it screamed its chilling scream, like that of a banshee, and stampeded off to the woods. I couldn't open the door to retrieve my own brother's remains. I haven't slept since then, I just watched the door and listened for him, waiting for him to come back. It's just me and my mother now. She doesn't eat, sleep or drink. She hasn't moved from her chair in three days. Until her death, I don't think she ever moved again actually. It was a long night. Four days without sleep. I've heard the growls every night since my brother's grisly demise, but tonight, they were louder. It was tonight he would attack. I knew it. I loaded my rifle and waited for it, thinking he would come through the door or the window in the kitchen. I was wrong. My mother sat in the other room. But even with my phobia of it, I let her be. It was late when I began to hear the scraping along the side of the house. Four times he circled. We were trapped, and he knew it. It stopped, and my heartbeat quickened. As if in slow motion, I realized where he had stopped just a moment too late right next to the side of the house where my mother was. I knew my fears were true when I heard the disheartening sound of the window shattering in the other room. As I rooted, I heard the beast's call and dropped to my knees. I saw him walk to my mother and in one stroke took her throat and within a heartbeat her chest. He screamed and dove from her room. This was just a few short hours ago. The scrapings are starting again. To whomever finds this, leave. Quick. Don't look back. Oh god, the scraping stopped. I don't have long. These have been my final thoughts, and the last ones I'll ever have. Please heed this warning.
My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it for a few reasons. I think it's the first story he ever told me as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather died. But honestly, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV, or sometimes you overhear something in a public space. People talk about ghosts and aliens, and you think to yourself, that isn't real. They're making it up, or they're mistaken, or they're crazy, or something like that. You just can't believe it. Until something happens. Something that brings it all together connects the dots in a way you didn't think of before. Maybe it happens to you. Maybe you hear the same story again and again, happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it, even though he swore up and down it was true. It wasn't until I started clicking around the internet, I started to believe. I started to hear other stories, just like the one my father told me. It didn't take long for me to believe in the rake. That's not what my father called it, of course. He never used the internet in his life. He wouldn't know what the consensus has taken to name in it. When he chose to call it something other than it or that thing, he called it Skinwalker, after the old Cherokee tale his grandfather told him. But I'll tell you the story, the way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night, he tell me. Coyotes, we kill them for 50 bucks a skin. They lived on a dairy farm in Ohio. They killed calves sometimes. We do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes, while we were out, we'd come on a deer and kill it. Our landlord didn't mind, and it could feed our family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and heading home, walking because we didn't have a car or some four-wheeler back then. We'd cut through the woods. That's when we came upon it. Blood everywhere, splattered on the trees, in the grass, in the creek, everywhere. At first, we figured it was a pack of coyotes. We'd seen it sometimes. They can't scavenge and start hunting deer or cattle. The worst was when they bred with feral dogs. But this wasn't like that. See, when a pack of dogs or wolves or coyotes attack something, they do it right. They'll pick off one that's weak or sick or old or just small. They'll hunt it, draw it into a corner, some place it can't get out of, and they'll run it right to the biggest one, the alpha. And that deer will never see that alpha. It might hear it, but it won't see it. It'll just notice that its throat is gone, and then it'll drop dead. It's quick, it's clean. That wasn't what happened here. Something had run up on a den of deer. Coyotes won't attack a den, wolves neither, because they'd get too much of a fight. There were three, I think, three bodies just torn apart. You'd see a head here, a leg here, a torso there. Predators don't do that. They don't leave behind scraps. What had done this hadn't done it for food. It had done it for fun. But we didn't know that. We saw a bunch of carcasses and we think it's something we gotta take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs. But I wasn't leaving him. And I was damn sure I wasn't walking through two miles of woods alone with nothing but a 22 and a pocket knife. He was 13 at the time, so a .22 was about the only gun he could reliably use. 
Dad had the shotgun, and I wasn't going anywhere without it. It took me a while to convince him, but finally we began tracking whatever did that. It wasn't hard either. We just followed the blood. Either that thing bled a deer before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. I don't know. I know that I'd never seen my dad so scared before that night. We started hearing noises. I've been in a lot of woods in my life. I've been all over the world, and ain't never heard noises like I heard that night. I heard things screaming. Heard deer and fox and rabbits and raccoons and birds. Just scared. Keep in mind, this is maybe 12 or 1 o'clock. Except the fox and some birds, nothing was supposed to even be awake. But they weren't just awake, they were moving. I saw flocks of birds that night fly straight into trees just trying to get out of there. We came up on a pack of coyotes, nearly shot a couple thinking it was what we were looking for. But then we saw they were running towards us. They ran right past us, didn't even notice. Then some deer did the same, then some rabbits, squirrels, foxes, even a couple wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other, and the only thing they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together, that maybe whatever we were tracking, it wasn't something we were supposed to see, and it wasn't something we could kill. I don't know why we didn't just go home, I guess we were curious. I think that was my dad's nature, to go to war trouble, to fight, and knowing what I knew about my father during the war, my nature was to stay close to him. We finally get to an open valley, it was normal, a soy field, but it wasn't in season so it was just flat dirt. We saw the tracks then, a lot of the animals fleeing the forest had paved over the land, but where that deer blood was, nothing had taken a single step, like they were leaving it for us to find. The tracks were shallow, whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds, but that didn't mean much. A bobcat weighing 40 pounds wet nearly tore out my damn throat once. All that means is that it's quick and hard to hit. So we followed the tracks, and it doesn't take us long to find where it is. There's this old schoolhouse that sits on the top of a hill. Half of it had been ripped out by a tornado. Nobody lived there, not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there sometimes, or druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that was it. Maybe it was some sick kid riding a high, but we didn't think that for long. We get within 50 yards, and we hear this noise. A screeching kind of sound. It was sort of made up of two different sounds. One was a high-pitched screech, another was a low-pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear this sound. I can remember thinking that it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swinging water in a bucket back and forth. My dad looks at me, kneels down and whispers, I gotta stay behind him because we're about to corner him. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially when it's a predator but we can tell by the tracks that it's just one. He tells me it's probably a single, feral dog, probably rabid. The plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating, shoot it, and then keep shooting it till it don't move anymore, then slit its throat. If it gets the dad, it's my job to shoot or stab it or get it off of him. So, 
He walks up, and I'm right behind him, just a tad to his side, so I can see what it is. I wish to this day I hadn't. It was leaning over a carcass, tears up its flesh, and throws what it doesn't nibble aside. There's blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It's pale, white, human-looking, but not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat like a monkey, hunched over. Its hands were normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end. So we see that, and my dad hesitates. He wasn't about to fire on a person, so he clears his throat to try get it to turn around. I swear to God, all the noise just ceased. I had never heard true silence before that, and not after it. But for two seconds, nothing, nothing made any noise which made it all the louder when it turned around, made this shrill cry, and jumped on Dad. He got a shot off. I think he missed. If he hit the thing, it didn't mind. But it was on him. Tears part of him off. I start shooting it with the 22, point blank, but it barely bled the thing. I got a five rounds, and then I started hitting it with a gun butt. But it wasn't budging. It didn't even register that I was there. It clawed at my dad, taking off bits of his flesh. It started on his torso, ripping off the skin, his tit, and then moved up. It tore off his throat. It tore off his nose, his eyes. It scalped him. Then, it started digging in and ripping off the bottom half of his jaw. The little bones and that tube in your neck, then his ribs. I don't exactly remember what happened, but somehow, my dad's knife ended up in this thing's shoulder, and my dad ends up on my back. I'm running, and by God, I'm running faster than I'd ever have run before or after, and it's following me. I end up back in the woods, opposite the ones we've been in. I'm heading towards my landlord's house, because it's half a mile away. I can hear this thing, screeching and moaning. I hear the tree branches crack and get thrown around. It sounds like someone's taking an axe to every single tree I pass. It's cracking so loud and often, but I just ain't looking back. Finally, I trip into gravel. I look up, and there's my landlord and a bunch of his buddies drinking around a campfire. I scream and I cry, and they come over. I'm telling them to call an ambulance, but he looks at me, and I'll never forget what he said. What's that on your back? He asked me. Just as he said it, he saw. One of those god-awful flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere. It was what was left of my dad. Most of his head, his torso, but nothing after the waist. Suddenly, we hear it, screeching. He grabs me. My dad gets thrown on the ground. I'm fighting him, crying, because I think we can still save him, somehow. But my dad had been gone before I ever picked him up. He has to pick me up and throw me inside before I come with him. He and his buddies were all inside, and they're locking doors, and getting guns. The landlord's asking me, what happened? What happened? But I just don't know what to tell him. He pieced enough of it together to understand that there was something dangerous out there. All the lights in the house are on, and someone calls the cops. They'll be there, but in 15 minutes. We look outside and see it walk in front of the fire they've made. Don't know what it is. One of them says it looks like an ape. Suddenly, something goes through the window. We shoot at it, but it ain't the thing. It's my landlord's dog. 
Just the body though, not its head or legs. We start pushing things in front of the doors and windows when we hear something in the garage. I remember one of his friends saying that the doors were open. We hear metal and glass just get ripped apart. We put a couch and a TV in front of the door to the garage. It banged around some more, but then it got quiet. Not silent like it was before. We could hear it move around some, and the guys were talking, making sure the guns were ready. Someone hands me a pistol. No sooner did I cock the hammer back, did we hear something shatter upstairs. Then, we heard it screech again, except now it was louder, and it didn't echo and fade out, because it was inside. We all rushed to the one door leading upstairs, and we got to it just as the thing did. It opened it just a bit, and four or five men just slammed into it. He got his hand through. Someone with a shotgun took care of that, put the barrel right up to its wrist, and pulled the trigger. Cut its hand off clean. That only ticked it off though. It started pushing on that door, clawing. We were on the other side, pushing as best we could, and it was on the other side, doing the same. That wood just wasn't going to hold, so someone tells us to keep our heads down. Suddenly, the top half of the door is just gone. My ears are ringing, and there's splinters everywhere. Two or three of them just unloaded on the top of that door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to that door. What was left of it. The sun was up before they got me off of it. They put me in a hospital for a while. A lot of people talked to me, but I didn't talk back. Not for a long, long time. When I got back home, I got a job from the landlord, working on the farm. We didn't talk much, not about the thing. But I signed up for the army when I was 19, and he sent me down to drink some scotch as a send-off. I asked him, right away, what the police told him. The story they went with was a wild animal, probably a wolf, or maybe a bear that had migrated north. I asked him how they could say that when they had the hand. He looked at me, stunned. He tells me that the hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car wrecked, drove into a tree, died on impact. The hand was never found, probably taken away by an animal. The cops, when they would acknowledge the hand existed at all, said it was simply the paw of the bear that looked like a human hand. I never talked to the landlord again. He went missing when I was in basic. The cops never found him. They said he owed some people some money and just ran away. But I don't think it's that simple. I never went back to those woods. I wouldn't, even if I had the whole goddamn US Army at my back. But that was a lie. When my mother died, I don't think my father felt he had anything left, and that he might as well settle old scores. He went to those woods. He never came back. The FBI was called. They did a show for everyone involved. But I knew they weren't really looking. I had to get one drunk and slip him a few fifties before he finally told me that they get a few calls about those woods every year. About someone up and vanishing. But that was all he wanted to tell me. Before he got up and left with the rest of his team. He wrote the rake onto a napkin. I didn't know what it meant until I searched for it on the internet. Honestly, I would have rather not known.
I like the desert at night. They say it's dangerous to be out here, but I like it. It's good to sit by a campfire and drink a beer, out here where there isn't any noise or traffic. You can see all the stars because there aren't any electric lights that chase them away. Sometimes the wind sings to you, but then somebody usually comes along and messes it up somehow. Mostly it's drunks who want to beat you up because you're from the reservation. So when I heard pebbles shifting somewhere off to my left, the hairs on the back of my neck started to tingle, and my hand inched closer to my bowie knife. The figure that came walking out of the darkness didn't look very threatening. Just an old man wearing a traditional Navajo clothing and leaning on a crooked walking stick as he shuffled quietly towards me. Getting cold, came the old man's voice, dry as the desert. I expected him to say more, but instead, he just sat down across the campfire from me, laying the walking stick casually across his lap. There was something about him that made me uneasy, but my apprehension increased when his hand vanished into a leather pouch that hung from his belt. He pulled forth only a crumpled pack of cigarettes, holding them slightly towards me. Smoke? Sure, I replied as my nerves began to relax. When he tossed me the pack, I noticed there were only two cigarettes left inside. I took one and tossed the pack back to him. I held my chrome zippo towards him, but he instead took a wooden match from behind his ear, scraping it against a small grey rock that dangled from a leather cord worn around his neck. The sudden flare of light illuminated his ancient, weathered face, and his eyes seemed to sparkle eerily for a moment. Then, he sat smoking, silently. Dangerous out here at night, you know. He spoke softly after a while. Lots of things come out at night, even things nobody believes in anymore. They still come around sometimes. I smiled a little. You mean ghosts and goblins? Maybe ghosts, he answered, after considering it a moment. Not goblins, I don't think. Not even sure what a goblin is. But there are other things too. Things like the skinwalkers. You know about them? A sudden chill ran the length of my spine as the old man studied me quietly. Mom used to tell me stories about them when I was little, I mumbled. Then you know what can happen, said the old man. They take the shape of a man and wear the skin of a man, but they're really more like an animal underneath. They have powers too. Folks used to say only a shaman could defeat them. He turned his attention to the campfire. His image seemed to ripple behind the waves of heat rising from the flames. Embers dance around him like angry red fairies. Lots of other things out here too, he continued. The Wendigo, the Chupacabra, all sorts of things. They don't come around much anymore, but sometimes they do. Silence settled over us like a damp woolen blanket, the campfire seeming to begrudge us what little heat it was providing. The stars twinkling above seemed suddenly to be laughing silently, sharing some sinister joke among themselves. The thin slice of moon sank behind a lone cloud bank, as though unwilling to witness whatever might transpire. The beast attacked us without warning. I felt claws sink into my back as a great weight fell upon me. Then, it was gone, and I rose to see the old man falling backwards. Whatever was on top of him wasn't visible, but I could see jagged rips appearing in his clothing and in his flesh. Then suddenly, 
He was thrusting the walking stick upwards, and there was a terrible screeching sound. The creature fell backwards into the fire, and became visible as it writhed in the flames. I can't really describe it. Imagine a pale white maggot, taller than a man. Its bloated, mushy body, bristling with claw-like barbs. Something like a mouth at one end, with rows of shark-like teeth lining the inside. A clump of black eyes that seemed completely lifeless as it rose from the fire, and again hurt itself towards the old man. I'm not a hero. My brain was screaming for me to get out of there. To just run. Run anywhere. To just get away. But then I heard the old man's screams. And I saw the empty cigarette pack lying crumbled on the ground. And something inside me stopped shaking. And started getting angry instead. I tore away my clothes and then tore away my skin as well. Revealing my true form. I was springing towards the ugly monstrosity before I really had any time to think about it, which is probably just as well. As I struggled with the creature, attacking savagely with my own teeth and claws, I caught a glimpse of the old man rising weakly to his feet. His walking stick was beginning to glow faintly, casting an eerie green light upon him as he moved forwards. He plunged the stick deep into the creature's side. The thing stopped biting at my face and made that deafening screech sound again. But this time, it didn't stop screeching for a long time. I'm not sure if it died or just went someplace else when it faded from view. I hope it died. The old man reached down to recover his walking stick from where it had fallen watching me carefully. It's difficult for me to speak when I'm in my true form, but I can manage if I concentrate. What was it? I managed to ask. No idea, he answered with a puzzled frown. We stood, staring at each other for a moment. You gonna need a new shirt, I pronounced quietly, pointing a talon at his torn and ruined clothing. That's nothing, he chuckled. You're gonna need new skin. But then his smile faded. His grip tightened on the walking stick as he studied me in the campfire's flickering light. You can relax. I lisped. Shame and skin won't work on me. His eyes drifted uncertainly to his walking stick. Still, he said softly, I'm supposed to destroy you. Yep, I hissed. Same here, old man. We continued staring uneasily at each other for a moment longer. Then the old man's smile slowly returned. Crazy world, ain't it? Crazy world, I agreed. As he turned to go, I glanced around and saw the shredded remains of my jacket. Snagging it with a claw, I turned back towards the old man shuffling away into the darkness. Hey, Pops, I called quietly, tossing him the fresh pack of cigarettes that had been in my jacket pocket. I think I managed something like a human smile. He nodded thanks, and then vanished into the desert night. I sat back down beside my campfire, a million stars twinkled overhead. They say it's dangerous to be out here alone in the desert, but I like it. Sometimes the wind sings to you, and all you can do is sing back. <laughs>